On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including scientists growing plants in moon soil, NASA safety advisors are worried about Starliner and Starship, SpaceX looking to begin spacewalk training, Astra Rocket 4.0, and Orbex Space unveiling their new biofuel-powered rocket. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the Space Race. NASA-funded scientists at the University of Florida have successfully grown plants in lunar soil for the first time. The study was intended to support NASA's upcoming Artemis program with extra data and was accomplished by planting a hardy test plant, the Thalecrest, in lunar regolith brought back in the Apollo 11, 12, and 17 missions. Lunar soil hasn't been gathered by NASA since 1972, so it's a pretty guarded material. With that in mind, NASA agreed to lend just 12 grams collectively for the project. The soil was divided up by mission, with each one getting just 4 grams of soil, separated into 4 thimble-sized testing wells. The 12 wells, plus 4 extra control wells filled with simulated soil made from earthy volcanic ash, were all seeded with the Thalecrest and irrigated under some grow lights. Within 48 to 60 hours, all of the seeds began to germinate. The earthly control wells did the best, sprouting healthy plants very quickly. The remaining wells sprouted at various speeds and predictably were not as healthy. But this is exactly why this test plant was used. Thalecrest was chosen not just for its hardiness, but also because it's the plant of choice for testing soils. Its genome is 100% mapped, which lets scientists pinpoint the exact issues that cause malnutrition, among other problems. And so, with the state of the sprout growing from the Apollo soils, we gain some important information. First and foremost is that we can grow plants in moon soil. It's possible. And that is tremendous news. The cost of shipping food or soil to grow food to the moon is too expensive to allow for a stable lunar colony. Finding ways to get material at the landing site is a big part of the setup missions in the Artemis program, with lunar rovers attempting to find water at the moon's south pole and have designs that consider making use of lunar regolith to make cement on site. Following that philosophy, discovering and refining our ability to grow plants in moon soil is a huge hurdle to cross for any potential lunar colony. The second major information gained is that older or mature lunar regolith appears to be less hospitable. Samples from Apollo 11 fared worse than 12, and Apollo 12 samples did worse than 17. The researchers believe this is because the samples from the Sea of Tranquility, Apollo 11's landing site, are very old comparatively. The Sea of Tranquility hasn't seen any volcanic or meteor impact related shakeups in a very long time while Apollo 17 landed in Taurus Littrow, a mountainous area which had been churned up by meteor strikes relatively recently. Researchers are pretty sure that the problem lies in the radiation and solar winds that older soils have been exposed to. Basically, the longer the soil has been blasted by the sun and other cosmic energy, the less fertile it is. And this is backed up by the genetic data. Remember earlier when we said Thalecrest was fully genetically mapped? Well, when scientists tested the lunar samples, they were able to reference which genomes responded to the harsher growing conditions. In the Apollo 11 soil, over 465 genes meant to help the plant deal with stress had been activated. In the Apollo 12 and 17 samples, 235 and 113 respectively. So the most obvious benefit to this research is that we now know that we're going to have to choose a landing site with much younger geology than we ever have before. If Thalecrest is struggling, it's going to be almost impossible to grow potatoes, for instance. Regardless, this report has NASA scientists and researchers optimistic about a future colony with actual farms, especially if we can find an area affected by former lunar lava activity. But the other benefit to this science is the possibilities on other worlds. We've all been dreaming of Mars, and while we'd need some Martian soils to test, 
this experiment will help us narrow our search to more potentially viable areas and landing sites. But it's still more than that. Plants are fundamental to our survival, and if we plan on reaching other worlds, we're going to have to bring our little green buddies with us. As NASA scientist Sharmila Badarchaya put it, plants are what enable us to be explorers. I've been eating a lot healthier as my goal for 2022, and it's getting a lot easier with today's sponsor, Monk Pack. Monk Pack offers low sugar, keto friendly bars that are plant based, gluten free, and non GMO. I love that I can have a quick snack that is super tasty without worrying that I've consumed a bunch of carbs and sugar. I don't know how they do it, but they don't sacrifice taste. They're fantastic and delicious. With only 150 calories or less per bar, along with two to three grams of net carbs and only one gram of sugar, you can grab a bar at any time without worrying about the consequences. And best of all, they come in a variety of flavors, including coconut cocoa chip, caramel sea salt, and peanut butter cocoa chip. I'm a sucker for dark chocolate and salt. They're my favorite. Right now, you can get 20% off your first purchase of any Monk Pack product by visiting monkpack.com and entering our code SPACERACE at checkout, or just simply click the link in the description down below to get 20% off. Thank you to Monk Pack for sponsoring today's video and keeping us healthy, and thanks to all of you for helping support our sponsors and this channel. And now let's get back to the video. NASA's Independent Safety Advisor Panel has cautioned the agency against fast-tracking a crewed test flight of Boeing's Starliner, with specific concern being noted for the capsule's parachutes and the Boeing staffing levels on the program. The warning came on the heels of NASA managers clearing Boeing's Starliner capsule for its second orbital flight test, scheduled for May 19th, and included a mention of obvious safety concerns about SpaceX's plans for their Starship launches from Pad 39A at Cape Canaveral. The Commission's main concern seems to be centered around taking the time needed to secure these two companies' crewed launch capabilities. As they note, the commercial crew program is extremely important for NASA operations. Starliner has had no shortage of issues, including software problems during its first orbital test and those infamous valve issues that kept the original orbital flight test too grounded. Boeing is hoping that the uncrewed May 19th test will go off without a hitch and certify the craft for a crewed test so they can begin sending astronauts to the International Space Station. NASA has also been eager to get Starliner running so that they have a second crew rated vehicle to use alongside SpaceX's Dragon capsule, which has been making crewed launches since May 2020. And while it would be nice to have a redundancy, Starliner may take more time, even with a successful orbital test. Boeing's parachutes are reportedly lagging behind in certification. Their designers are considering redesigning those pesky oxidizer valves that keep sticking, and the Safety Commission notes that the ULA has only 24 more human-rated Atlas V rockets to fly before they're retired to make way for the new Vulcan Centaur rockets. Over at 39A, the Safety Commission's concerns about SpaceX have more to do with the proximity of planned Starship launches to current infrastructure and the planned end of Dragon capsule production. SpaceX said last year that they planned to end production of new Dragon capsules after the final four vehicles were finished. The Dragons are rated for at least five flights, and both SpaceX and NASA believe they can certify the now very flight-proven capsules to make any additional missions. But the Commission is a little nervous about Dragon's ability to keep servicing the ISS through to the end of its life cycle, especially given Starliner isn't up and running yet. The Safety Commission did note, however, that SpaceX is giving NASA a huge amount of data, almost too much, which is an interesting problem to have. As for Starship, the main concern is that the planned launch facility is about 300 yards from the next pad over, and there's obviously some worry with the plans to launch and land the returning Super Heavy booster and upper stage so close to Pad 39A's critical infrastructure. Pad 39A is the only launch facility capable of launching larger payloads, so the caution is understandable. But with SpaceX going through FAA environmental reviews for their Starship launch facility, and Boeing designers carefully considering their options, 
It seems like everyone is taking safety seriously. Hopefully the commission won't have to do anything, but watch the show. The crew of SpaceX's future Polaris Dawn launch are ready to begin training for the mission, which will include the first ever commercial spacewalk. A crew of four SpaceX civilian astronauts will launch into an elliptical low Earth orbit, flying between 190 kilometers and 1400 kilometers. The previous altitude record for orbital crew spacecraft was the Gemini 11 mission in 1966 at 1,372 kilometers. Once in orbit, they'll spend five days doing research and testing SpaceX's new EVA suit with a spacewalk. The new suit reportedly very similar in appearance to the intravehicular activity suits already used by SpaceX crews will have better material to protect from potential debris strikes, an upgraded visor, new seals, and joints everywhere to aid in movement. A fully pressurized suit requires a lot of exertion to move, which is why NASA EVA suits and the new SpaceX ones have mechanical joints to help reduce the load on the astronaut. And all of this is supported by a tether that provides consumables, power, and communications to the wearer. Commander Jared Isaacman and pilot Scott Petit have been selected to complete the spacewalk itself. The modified Dragon capsule Resilience, which will have its cupola from the Inspiration4 mission replaced with an airlock, will dive briefly to 500 kilometers, and the two astronauts will exit the vehicle for anywhere from 30 to 90 minutes. Because there is very little room in the Dragon capsule, the entire vehicle will be depressurized for the walk, meaning the other two astronauts will have to stay in their own pressurized suits until their fellow astronauts return to the capsule. Isaacman, Petit, and their two other crew members, Sarah Gillis and Anna Menon, have all either supported or flown in Dragon missions previously. For Isaacman, this will be his second time commanding a commercial mission after successfully commanding Inspiration4. Aside from the spacewalk, the Polaris Dawn mission will be conducting several experiments on human health in orbit and on Earth, and will be testing Starlink laser-based communications in space for the first time. The launch of Polaris Dawn is scheduled for no earlier than November 2022. Astra has just released information on their new Rocket 4.0 at their Space Tech Day 2022 event. The new Rocket 4 is capable of launching over double the previous Rocket 3's payload of 150 kilograms into low Earth orbit and 200 kilograms into Sun synchronous orbit. To achieve this, the Rocket 4 is powered by five Delphin engines producing over 70,000 pounds of force, and all of that on a base budget of $3.95 million. The bigger, more powerful rocket is intended to capitalize on the market need for mega constellation launches, according to CEO Chris Kemp. Reportedly, paying to launch a 200 kilogram payload on a SpaceX rideshare mission would cost about $1.1 million, much less than a $4 million rocket for. But with SpaceX's rideshare, a customer has less control over orbital insertion, launch dates, and access to the payload. That's not a problem for most companies, but Astra's goal is to provide dedicated launches designed specifically for the client, justifying the higher price. Currently, Astra keeps the price relatively low, using rockets made from cheap materials and production techniques rather than reusability. Kemp says that the company would be open to the idea of reuse, but that it's not really feasible with the way Astra operates currently. Like Rocket 3, Rocket 4 is designed for easy transportation, able to be packed into standard cargo containers. The launch system itself, Launch System 2.0, is designed to handle weekly launches. Astra hopes to conduct the first test launch of Rocket 4 later this year. Scotland-based launch company Orbex Space unveiled their new biofuel-powered rocket Orbex Prime last week at their environmentally friendly Scotland launch site. The Orbex Prime is designed to launch microsatellites and other small-scale vehicles into a polar orbit and return to Earth for reuse, leaving no orbital debris. Orbex Prime's big draw is the Orbex engines that burn low-carbon biopropane, which the company says reduces carbon emissions by 90% compared to traditional fuels. Though this does seemingly result in less thrust, as the Prime's payload is about 180 kilograms to sun-synchronous orbit, 
just slightly behind the smaller Rocket Lab Electron's 200 kilograms to small synchronous orbit. The Prime also sports low temperature turbo pumps for its first stage engines and a smart ignition system, which reportedly doesn't use moving parts or electrics to allow for on-orbit restarts. Orbex also joins the growing list of companies making use of increasingly reliable 3D printing to help the construction of their vehicle, with the Orbex Prime's combustion chamber and Orbex engines being entirely printed. CEO Chris Lemur believes Prime highlights just how far along our development path we now are. From the outside, it might look like an ordinary rocket, but on the inside, Prime is unlike anything else. Orbex plans to make a launch from their space hub Sutherland in Scotland once it's fully operational later this year. The northern site will be ideal for Prime's polar launches and for recovery after splashdown. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.